Okay, guys, I have another amazing strongman, a legendary man. This guy, I'm so excited to have him on. Uh, we've had a number of battles on the field over the years. I think we're possibly the two most battle-scarred athletes of all time in terms of injuries. But uh, I have the incredible Texas stone man, Travis Ortmeyer. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Laws. I appreciate that. And uh, I think you're absolutely right with the battle-tested and battle-scarred strongman. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, uh, I, I think probably if you put our injuries together, we probably outdo everyone else in the whole sports injuries combined. Well, there, there, there's a lot of guys that have had injuries, but we are two of, <laughs> two of the guys that seem to, particularly second half of our careers, I think, just seem to have hit been hit pretty badly. But... That being said, we have a lot of knowledge that we can pass on to the younger generation mm -hmm. these days. And we've learned a lot from, I know certainly I've learned a lot from, from a lot of the injuries because you have to, to, to come back. If, if, if you don't uh, you know, improve yeah. your, your knowledge and understanding of the human body, then you give up. And giving up- well, I think anybody who's enough. come back from an injury has learned immensely from it. That's the only way you can come back. Well, we'll talk about injuries, but I always like to start things with what got you interested in strength in the first place. I know you're a very sporty kid, and you know how did you come into the crazy world that is strongman? You know, um, I always liked weightlifting. I loved Conan. I thought Arnold Schwarzenegger was fucking awesome. I wanted to swing a sword and chop people in half, kind of stuff. You know, when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, and I was bullied a lot especially in middle school. I was a fat kid. I moved from Southern California to South Georgia when I was 11. And, uh, you know, I was, I was bullied unmercifully. unmercifully. And uh, it just, it was something I was fascinated with. The way that you could take who you are and create something better out of it. You know, so uh, you know, one summer... I remember mowing lawns and saving up money. And finally, I bought a uh, weight bench at the local Walmart. <clears throat> now, I didn't know that the weight bench didn't come with the weights. So my mom, she ponied up the $22 for a set of those plastic weights and, uh, and the dumbbells they came with. Now, I, uh, it, I didn't have a bar at that point. So you know, a few weeks later, I went in the kitchen and I... Uh, I took my mom's broom and sawed the end off and then tried to lie to her and tell her I didn't know what happened to her. That was my first bar. <laughs> but, uh, you know, from there, I just had a fascination with lifting. I loved it. I wanted to get stronger. I just, it was always a part of me. Um, you know, fast forward a decade and yeah, I was trying out bodybuilding shows I did two of them in high school and I realized they were uh, fundraisers for the football team. I wasn't on the football team. So I realized when I didn't even place and I was the only one in the whole show who knew what a fucking lat spread was, I realized how biased that shit was. And I didn't really like bodybuilding after that. I tried, but then, uh, and, and you know, excuse me to anybody out there who's bodybuilding and then it just, it's not for me. I'm just going to leave it at that. It's just not for me. I think that's, that's <laughs> fair Getting enough. There and posing, you know, fucking doing, I just, no. <laughs> Sorry for any bodybuilders. I respect the hell out of the sport. But, uh, and, you know, anyway, after that, I met uh, a guy named Marshall White. And I think you know Marshall. I know Marshall, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he and I were training at a local gym. And he was powerlifting. I was bodybuilding. And, you know, we started training together and decided to do a powerlifting meet. He was a 275, 125 kilos. I was a 110 kilo or 105 kilo. I'm not sure what the actual number was. But anyway, I'm, I'm considerably lighter. Yeah. And we didn't have any money. So we bought one bench shirt and one squat suit and shared it. <laughs> and it gets better so we got to this meet all the way in austin texas two and a half hours away paid a bunch of money to get there register blah 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 and they tell us you can't wear boxers you can only wear briefs yeah 
Oh, we had to go commando sharing the suit. <laughs> <laughs> <Brilliant>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, we, we both ended up bombing out of that meet. They were extremely strict. And I had no idea what calls were. I took my first squad out, squatted it, put it back in. And the ref, the judge is sitting there with his hand, just kind of looking at me. <laughs> no idea. To, to be fair, so many people don't understand the, the strictness of powerlifting. You know, especially yeah. when you come from either bodybuilding or strongman, where things are a little bit more relaxed. I mean, I've, I've seen people fail a lift in, in a powerlifting contest for moving their toe while squatting or having the yeah. wrong socks on or, you know, uh, the, the wrist strap, the, the, the ring that goes over your thumb. With a little thumb loop. Yeah. yeah. If yeah. that's not removed, yeah. you can fail the lift. So yeah. I, I, I can see it's why. crazy bullshit, but, you know, hey, everybody knows the rules are posted. Yeah, we yeah. just... <laughs> <laughs> so, we've, uh, we've you know, fast forward hard. another year or two, maybe another year. Uh, I've been training for 10 years at this point. I was going to school full time. I was working full time at a restaurant and I was training like my life depended on it. And I remember getting this idea of, you know, maybe I should just focus on graduating and then work and save money. And, you know, I felt this kind of sinking feeling in my chest. That sounds like, very sensible of you. Answer, But, you know, logically, I'm thinking this isn't really actually doing anything. And uh, it was like divine intervention. Because Marshall came to me and said, I'm going to do a strongman contest. And I remember saying, like those guys on TV, we'll never be that strong. What are you fucking crazy? <laughs> Nevertheless, he signed up. It was Texas Strongest Man. It was August 2nd in uh, north of Dallas. It was hot as freaking hell on a black top parking lot. So on the way there, Marshall was saying, I just don't want to finish last. I just don't want to finish last. And, and at this point, I was only going to help him. I was just training a partner. I didn't have any intention of competing. Uh, so we get there. And, you know, four and a half, five hours later of Marshall saying, I just hope I don't finish last. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, we're signing up. The promoter looks at me and says, hey, you know, you're here. Why don't you sign up? So you know what? You're right. All right. What the hell? I'll give it a shot. Marshall looked at me at that moment and he says, I'll never forget this. It changed my life. He says, man, I'm glad you signed up because now, at least now I know I won't take last. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I had a competitive bone in my body until he said that to me. Marshall, thank you. You changed my life, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so the next day we competed and uh, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. The guys were awesome. You know, the, just the atmosphere, going out there and putting your strength to the test. I had so much fun at that show that I dreamt of those implements. The feel of the farmer's walks in my hands, the smell of the tacky, the concrete ripping my skin off on the stones. I dreamt of that for six months, every freaking night. I was obsessed. So needless to say, that was my divine intervention. God saying, school, work, <laughs> you're done with that shit. <laughs> Here's where you're going. I'll be honest with you, Travis. I, I thought I was done with Strongman, but listening to you talk like this, I want to go lift some stones. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, that's, that's, it's infectious, man. It got in my soul. And, you know, it, uh, I lost that for a few years, but I feel like I've got it back. Well, you know, be before we go to that, I, Europe, want to, so. I, want, I want you to finish this story. Who Did you beat Marshall in this competition? Oh, shit. Yeah, man. I beat his ass. <laughs> I beat him for the next 10 years after that. <laughs> I hope he's watching. Marshall, and, if you're watching, he took, comment below. He did end up taking dead last at that show. <laughs> <laughs> but that just goes to show, you know, you create your reality. Whether you say you do or you don't want something, you still have to picture whatever it is you're modifying. So, so let, me, let me ask you a question there. Was Marshall a better powerlifter than you at the time? Yeah. yeah. Statically, he had a better deadlift. And No, I always had a better deadlift. He had a better squat and a better bench. It's interesting that, that so many great strongmen aren't always amazing powerlifters. I mean, these days, yeah. most of the guys are extremely strong. But you look back at kind of, you know, look at someone like Magnus Samuelson. He wasn't a yeah. great powerlifter. 
But athletic. man, when it came to the athletic events and the ability to carry awkward objects and that explosiveness and speed, he was phenomenal. And you, I mean, you you were you had an excellent deadlift, but you 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 were a really good athlete. I remember, you know, how explosive you were, how fast you were, and just how damn competitive you were. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, you had the foot speed and, and athleticism, coordination, but I think it was the fact that I was willing to kill myself to win. You know, <laughs> there's a few guys I've it's, seen that. I think you're one of them. It sounds strange, but to be good at strongman, you almost do need to have that kind of killer instinct that you're willing to go to, to the extreme levels to, to, to win. Yeah, I've, yeah I've lost, if you don't, the next guy will. Yeah, I, I'll happily admit that I don't have that killer instinct anymore, you know, and that's why it's time to, for me to step back. But I remember what it felt like when I was competitive. And, you know, we're all nice guys and stuff, but it was I'd, I'd look at you and like, I'm not losing to this bastard. <laughs> you know, I wanted to beat everyone. Yeah. And it just brought out this animal in me. And I know you were exactly the same. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Well, that's part of the fun. You know, you can you can oh. go out the field ready to kill that guy. And then as soon as you're done, you're his biggest fan. Yeah. Cheering him on the finish, you know. And that, I, I just fucking I love that. That's what I loved about it. When we, when we were competing a lot, we did a lot of the Champions League shows together. We competed. I think we were in the same group at Worlds a couple of times. You know, it was always yeah. a tough battle on the field. But afterwards, you, 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 your mates and you're kind of hanging out and you're supporting each other. You're talking about training. Oh, yeah. it's, it, I loved that when we were traveling a lot. And now the guys don't compete as often. It's more focused on the real big shows. But it, 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 the sport has changed over the last sort of 10 years. You know, one of the things you just touched on, the training advice. Before Instagram and, and Facebook and shit like that, that was what we relied on. I, I see guys now, I think, how fucking lucky are these bastards? They've got training, they've got rehab, they got prehab, they got all kinds of advice. They, they, it would have taken us five years to figure out what they can get in a week. I, now, I remember when I, when I started out, I just had to listen to the old guy in the gym. Yeah. That was as big as your pool was. You, you're like, that guy's the strongest guy in the gym. I'll go and ask him, you know. Yeah, must be doing oh, something right. Looking back, <laughs> that, that guy didn't really know what he was on about, especially in terms of, of strong man. But it was advice transferred down. Now, like you say, social media, type in, you know, training advice or whatever it might be, powerlifting, strong man, CrossFit, whatever you're into. There's a whole world of knowledge out there. And, and yeah, opens your eyes it, it's up. It's almost too much though. I think there's a lot of crap out there too. There is. You got to <laughs> learn how to kind of filter through what's right. Look at the guys who have been in it a long time. Listen to those guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're they're gonna have the best advice out there. Especially some of the ones that have made a lot of the mistakes. Yeah. I I I, I, I made a <laughs> shit ton of mistakes early on. You know, loads of oh, mistakes. Oh, yeah. I'll still make mistakes. Hell, I'm still freaking healing from a mistake. But a lot of people, they'll make one mistake and they'll give up. Whereas, yeah. to be fair to yourself, you know, uh, myself as well, we kept learning, re re rebuilding, adapting, and, and advancing your, your knowledge and coming back and, and learning from a lot of the mistakes. Well, that's it. you got to have a growth mindset. You can't have a fixed mindset. you got to have the, the mindset that says... What do I do right? What do I do wrong? How can I do it better? You can't go in with a, I'm the best. I already know what I'm talking about. And if it doesn't work, there must be something wrong with me. And I give up. I, I, I know you, you do, you do coaching willing. now yourself, don't you? And I, I do coaching as well. And even now I'm always trying to learn, you know, yeah. answers as a coach, understand your athletes are different to you. That's an important thing because there are coaches out there. That are like, right. You do it my way or the highway. Whereas I don't really believe that works for everyone. You've got to learn to adapt for people's bodies, their recovery rates, their work. There's so many factors that come into these things. Well, two, just, I mean, for an example, two of my training partners, one is extremely fast twitch, very explosive lifter. The other is a slow grind kind of guy. Yeah. And I mean, trying to like come up with programs of how do we work together, <laughs> it gets tricky. Yeah, but you know, right. I think trying to, to learn to adapt and understand all these different athletes has made me a better athlete because it's opened my eyes to things that I wouldn't have noticed before. And I feel now that I'm stronger than ever. My press isn't quite there, but I'm coming back from that shoulder surgery. Yeah. You know, but it, uh, my deadlift is as good as it's been. Squats better than ever. You know, and the first time farmers walks was 400 pounds a hand. You, you're always good. I mean, one of my favorite competitions, I remember you competing in 
was the Mohegan Sun, not the Mohegan Sun, the um, Madison Square Garden. Uh, the giant, oh, yeah. Giant Madison Square Garden. You yeah, were, where I handed Poundstone his ass. You and Poundstone, head to head. That was a great call. Oh, dude, that, that was one of my favorites. It was, it was, that was a fucking intense show. We did that in like two and a half hours. It was like six or seven events. I remember after one of the events, uh, it was the Axel Clean and Press. <clears throat> we had just gone and I'm over there puking in the trash can. And they just cut the field from 12 to six. So there was two heats and then it was me and Derek up. I just finished throwing up and they're like, Ortmeier, you're up. But, oh shit. You know, I put my belt on, I get under the yoke and then the whistle goes and boom, that was it. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen far too many strong men go from puking in a, in a bin to, to competition, including myself. It's, it's a common, it's a common thing actually in strong men. <laughs> well, I'll be there in a second. It shows the heart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> give me, give me one more breath, man. One more. Oh God. <laughs> But that's, that's what I love about the level of intensity of the guys that we get to compete against. And I say we get to compete against because it's an honor to compete with guys like you, you know, Derek back in the day, Misha Kuklaev, yeah. and then all these new guys. They're, they're just finding new ways to get stronger and stronger. It's, it's, so many, so many good guys. I mean, God. we've competed against a lot of great guys, and, and these new guys, they just keep getting better and better. And it's, it's really <laughs> cool to see. It's, it's, it's great to have been a part of it. But it's cool to see strongman evolving now and getting somewhere in terms of an actual sport rather than just a circus show. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think, you know, that the time we put in a decade ago, I'd say round one for me was uh, I think it was laying the groundwork, especially at least here in America and in England, because there wasn't really anybody for a long time in either country that, you know, came in and won world's strongest man we it was 2006 phil fister it was like a 25 year drought before that and i think you guys had a similar drought yeah yeah and uh you know it was this, this that era kind of building momentum and then you just you get the characters like eddie hall and half thor and, and you know people making a show tv and, and netflix series and all that shit and uh it, that momentum carried into a tidal wave and I love seeing these like half Thor's attempt on ESPN over here. You know, I think uh, the coronavirus epidemic was a massive amount of bullshit, but it, it actually, I think, has really helped further the sport as far as like, uh, like I said, mainstream media. Because yeah. ESPN would have shown anything like half Thor's deadlift no. if all the other sports weren't on TV. I think yeah. even World's Strongest Man is not on ESPN. play the shit out of them. What's sorry, that? Uh, sorry, I was talking. Um, I said ESPN don't even show World's Strongest Man anymore in the States, do they? No, I don't think so. They may show the reruns, but I think it's uh, CBS Sports or something bottom. That's right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's good to see. You know, I, I, I think the way the world works now anyway, you don't need it always on TV, the, the live streams and stuff like that. People watch TV in a completely yeah. different way. Now you have all the Netflix yeah. series, um, Amazon prime, those kind of things. There's that's a good so point. Yeah. Access to, to watch strong man, to watch training and, and get involved into the sport. I'm not, I mean, it's, it's great to have the primetime TV, but it's not as necessary as it used to be back in, you know, the early days when it was just a few channels yeah. showing things. Yeah. It doesn't have the stranglehold like it used to. I, for one, I don't even have normal cable. I just have Netflix and Amazon Prime. That's it. I don't worry about anything else. In fact, I like to just, you know, stick it to the cable companies. Like, there you go. There's my money, fact. Fucking assholes. Like, <laughs> There's so much you can watch just, just through sort of YouTube, um, you know, Amazon. Yeah. I, I have something called Now TV over here, which is just like loads and loads of different films and series that you can watch. So you can just watch things when you want to, and it's just so much easier. Yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. That's, uh, you know, people's schedules are freaking crazy now, yeah. especially, I don't know about you, but like online coaching, um, yeah, I guess you kind of get to make your own schedule, but uh, it kind of keeps things busy all day long. If, if you're I, I, with your athletes, you're always got something going. I am nonstop with my, uh, I communicate. One thing I always try and do with my clients is communicate with them regularly. Cause I feel like if you're, if you're having an online coach, it shouldn't just be about, 
sending out a training program for them to get on with. It's it's about that communication, building up a relationship Teaching. with that person, understanding how they react best, changing things when you need to. And that's what I always focus on. But yeah, like you say, it takes up a lot of your time. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's the hallmark of a good coach right there is one, what you're learning, but you're teaching everything that you've got. You know, you that for anybody watching out there, if you're looking for a coach and they just hand you some program and then leave you to it, yep. dump his ass. Get a new if coach. You get a hold of that person. If they don't respond in a week or two, then just they're not working for you. I mean, maybe if you just want a $10 template or a $50 template, what that's fine. Yeah. But if you're yeah. coaching, they got to respond within a day or two, you know, sometimes three days, maybe they go on vacation or something. But, you know, the guys that come to me, I've had a couple that are like, I haven't heard my, from my coach in two or three weeks now. I'm like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that, that's crazy. I mean, some, I, I, my wife has said I've got to sort of hold back a little bit. I, I almost re I reply to people daily, like usually as soon as I can. But at least if they message me that day, I will get back to them within at least 24 hours at worst. That will be at worst. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if you're waiting weeks or two weeks for, for a coach to respond to you, it doesn't matter how good their program is. I would get a new coach because you can pay for a program anywhere. That's not the hard yeah. bit of coaching. But um, yeah, no. you're not learning anything. So you, you're you're doing a lot of online coaching now yourself. Yeah, and it's uh, it started to pick back up, but you know when when COVID hit, I think I lost seventy five percent of my business. And Unfortunately, for a lot of people in every industry, it wasn't just the fitness industry, but every yeah. industry was massively hit. Um, Hopefully things will start to pick up and get back yeah, to, to pick up now. I think it, the world's starting to relax a little bit. And, you know, even, uh, even the governor has mandated, we all wear masks outside, but I don't see anybody following that rule. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> it seems that a lot of people were sort of really strictly sticking to the, the rules originally. And then, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what it's like so much in the States. I have seen a few things on the news. I'm one of those people, I, when it all hit, I did watch the news because I was like, Jesus, this is serious. But normally I'm a person that I like to live in my own little bubble and I don't watch yeah. the news. I'm much happier because the news is always depressing to me. There's always negative things. And, and I like to try and surround That's myself. That's how they hook people. Yeah. yeah, I like to surround myself in this like positive bubble. You know, my wife's a very supportive, positive person. She's been a great influence on me. So, and I'm the kind of person that, I can get down into a bit of a, a downward spiral and get quite negative. And you know, that way, when, when you get into that zone, it's hard to motivate yourself to do things sometimes. And uh, I mean, I, I know no. you've been through some dark times. Maybe we'll touch on those in a minute. But yeah, I was going to uh, say, trying, yeah, to, uh, trying, to, trying to focus on, on the positives and, and <laughs> keep the negatives out has been a, a blessing to me, to be honest. I think it's too easy to just let all these negative outside influences affect you and get yourself into that downward spiral. Well, you, you can kind of see it, especially across America right now. Uh, all it took was one little spark for everybody to explode. And then you see all this rioting and looting and protests and this. And, and you know, the thing that sparked it, George Floyd, that was a, a tragedy. Yeah. It was horrible the way he was pinned down. But it doesn't warrant burning down cities and doors. These are just people who are pissed off after three months of being stuck inside, yeah. forced to just eat their own shit, basically. You know, like, you know, when, when people can't work, they stress out. They can't eat. I know people that lost their homes, got kicked out, got nowhere to go. And, and I was trying to find an apartment during this time, and a lot of places wouldn't even see you. Yeah. You'd have to do some virtual tour. So, I mean, if you're losing your home and then you can't get a new one, I can see why people got pissed off and they just got fed up. And, uh, yeah, you got Americans. We love to fight. We love to, you know, we love to riot and protest. And, and yeah, all it took was a little spark. Yeah, and it's, it, uh, hopefully things are calming down a bit now and people can just get back to working, you know, earn a living, just get on with their lives. Because that's I think that's all that any of us want to do. Just, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, everything's kind of opened up. Yeah. Uh, well, you got like California, who's still extremely strict, but nobody really 
thinks much of California except for Californians nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> so where where are you living right now? I am Reno. I'm as close Reno. to California. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I got we got to deal with California attitude over here. <laughs> I'm not getting involved in this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving them shit. But <laughs> friends of Cali. Uh, it's it's good. It, just, it, it, it reminds me of the the banter back in the competitive days. It's it's brilliant. <laughs> so let's let's bring it back to strongman because this is talking strongman after all we're not talking politics here oh um, uh, yeah yeah right. as much as it's it's good to discuss the what's going on and everything but um i want to talk to you about some of your best results obviously we spoke about the um madison square garden but you had some brilliant performances at arnold's at world strongest man you, you know for a good i guess between 2008 to 2011 you were you were one of the top guys in the world always competitive, always kind of, you know, podiuming at big contests? I think uh, it started 2005 when I went to IFSA Worlds. You know, that back in 2005, 6, 7, IFSA and World's Strongest Man split. <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, IFSA kind of had the dominant athletes of the time, and in 2008 it came back together. You know, obviously Marius was at World's Strongest Man for 2006, 7 and all that, but um, I think I started out 10th my first two years at IFSA Worlds. Uh, had to do a qualifier the day before the qualifiers for the 2007 Worlds started. So I came into that one a little tired. Um, then 2008, when, when we got together at World's Strongest Man, uh, took fifth. 2009, took fifth. We were in the same group that year, qualifying mm -hmm. Then uh, 2010 took fifth again with that broken ankle. I think I was on pace. You were I think flying on Z for for first. It was uh, that was probably you at your best at Worlds, wasn't it? You were really going well. Yeah, yeah, and lighter than I had usually been, but uh, you know, it, it seemed to pay off for me. I had a couple other things going on that kind of messed with me, at least mostly during the, uh, the qualifiers. Um, you know, that's a, some we'll get into probably, but yeah, I think overall the 2010 finals would have been my best performance, but instead it turned into a hanging on for dear life. And I really, really, really wanted that fourth place because I was, I was kind of hanging out in fourth place by myself until the stones and Stefan Solby came in and took my point. Cause you, you, you were fifth three times, three times. Yeah. That's Every way you can do it. You know, 2008, I was fifth, sixth, the whole time. 2009, I was, I had, I had broken my AC joint with a single finger in training. And so we started with the farmers and I couldn't carry it. You know, it was a terrible, I took last place on the farmers that year in the final. So I worked my way back from 10th to fifth. And then in 2010, I started in first and kind of fell back to fifth. So any way you can get there. <laughs> So if you go to Worlds again, your plan is to come fifth, right? <laughs> I was 10th two years at, at IFSA Worlds. I was fifth three years at World's Strongest Man. I think it's first four years. Okay. That's, the, that's my logic anyway. <laughs> you performed very well at the Arnold's as well. You had a lot of consistent... You are on the podium a few times at the Arnold's, weren't you? Yeah, I was uh, third in 2009 and third in 2010. And... I was still kind of nursing that broken ankle from Worlds 2010 all the way into beginning of 2011. I still took fourth that year. So it's, it's impressive because the Arnold's is obviously <laughs> like it was the real heavy contest, and you weren't yeah. necessarily known as the, the static monster. You you were a good athlete. But if it was uh, if it was static squat and static log press, I probably wouldn't have done as well. But like heavy moving events i was good with heavy frame carry heavy stone heavy axle yeah that kind of stuff and heavy dumbbells i was really good with all of you were good at the dumbbell yeah good. so the log was the one that always kind of threw me threw me for a loop you know it was uh that's a great thing with strongman it's like there's so much variety that i mean i just to take myself as an example i've never lost lost an axle to graham hicks and Graham's a much stronger presser than me. 
but the axe sort of requires a lot of different types of strength to get it up to your, your chest. And, and I, I just managed to get a lot of leg power into things like the axle. Yep, Whereas on log, too. log it, Graham would destroy me where it requires a bit more, you know, upper body tricep and, and shoulder strength. He, he's so strong in those type of movements. His log press is freaking ridiculous. Oh, him, I am Bibby. I mean, Luke Stoltman, all those guys, their pressing is just, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Um, but, but, you know, you were really good at things like the, the, the blocks and the, and the, the, the stones that we pressed rather than oh, just yeah. any awkward stuff. Yeah. That yeah. was where the balance and athleticism came in, I guess. And that's where a lot of powerlifters struggle as well. They have this amazing like pressing power, but it's these weird events that we have in strongman that are a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly yeah. It, it, balance it, it, comes in. Flexibility comes in. Very true. You get a lot of like uh, muscle bound guys. They, they struggle with that mobility to get under certain events. So that's, that's the, that's what I love about strongman is you can never guarantee what's going to happen with the results. You know, absolutely. Uh, absolutely both of us have had something you can have a guy who just is athletic as hell like like uh matus kilishkowski he's uh unbelievable athletic but he's also strong as crap he's dangerous he is (laughs) if he can consistently deadlift well everyone's fucked (laughs) that's kind of what i'm thinking but you know that's the other thing that i kind of like about strongman is there there's Guys who are just ridiculous with all these events, and then there's just going to be that Achilles heel. There always seems to be something. Like even Zydrunas, as good as he was at everything, was terrible with an arm over arm. Yeah. Absolutely abysmal with arm over arm. It killed him. It almost lost the 2009 World's Strongest Man. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. It's, the, the guys that can be good at everything, that, that's why they're so so good. Because all yeah. of us, all of us are good at something. You know, if you're a top level strongman, we've all we've all got events that we 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 excel at and that we like. But the the real impressive guys, you can chuck any event at them, and they'll place at the top again and again and again. And now we we've got guys that just specialize on one event now. But to be a good strongman, you need to be a complete all round athlete. And that, you feel that's something that's been lost is the the well-roundedness no because you get guys like lissis and guys like kilius koski that really are complete athletes uh yeah. thor as well thor's you know an incredibly complete athlete but there's a lot of guys now i feel that they're well known for one event and Just they've not they've not won any contests but they're extremely good at one event. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Strongman's evolved and the, you know, the, the, the records have become a much more popular thing. But I was, I was talking to Zadrunas about the record attempts. And when he was competing, when you were competing, we just had to do them as part of a whole competition. Whereas now guys train specifically for one event. So it, it would be interesting to see if guys like Kazmaier just trained for one event or, or Zadrunas just trained for one event at their prime to see what they could do. But that's, a, that's another discussion for another day. But it, it yeah. does make me, it makes me think, you know, what is part And obviously people break records and then more people think that more people start to believe that, that more is possible. But I, I'm impressed with the guys. Yeah, frenzy like, for records the last few years. Yeah, very yeah. much so. World records were being smashed at every show for a while, it seemed. Yeah. Well, I, I've, <laughs> I've got to say that the guys like Kilius Koski that are just so good in contests, they're the ones that impress me the most. The, the guys that are complete and that can win all round. I agree. I got I to gotta say that I'm always impressed with Martins as well. Yeah, I'm very Phil, impressed. That guy who just kind of seems to be hanging out and chilling and then goes out and freaking just annihilates something. You know, what screw you, man? <laughs> I, I, I had him on last week and, and he's a really smart guy. He sort of he, is. he portrays this sort of you know laid back kind of and he is, he's a laid back guy but there's there's a lot of thinking going on there's a lot of thought process to his whole you know process of the way he does things he's a very smart athlete and yeah always good at peaking for big contests that he does very well yeah. that's something I haven't had a chance to pick his brain about we've talked a few times about I think you'd enjoy chatting to him he's he's a smart kid <clears throat> yeah he's uh. You know, he's one to watch out for. I think as long as he can keep his nerve in his neck yeah. under control. Injuries and stuff like that. Top for a long time. 
he's definitely going to be hard to beat. I mean, there's so many good guys now. We've talked about that. And I, I talk about how many good guys there are every time I'm doing commentary and, and doing these things. So I won't, I won't go into it right now. But the guys, know, you know, people watching know how many talented athletes there are right now. But I want to, yeah. I want to stick with, with you because we're going off on a tangent. Obviously, you ha- you'd had a, a brilliant career up until 2011. Yeah, well, okay. Um, 2012, 2011 kind of time. Things kind of changed a bit. I was pretty good through 2011. I was still doing all right in 2012. But by the end of 2012, I'd been dealing with that broken ankle issue. And it just, it weighed on me to the point where I didn't like training. I hated training. You know, and I was uh, I was competing when I shouldn't have competed. Um, you know, my wife was telling me, "I need we need the money. You need to go compete." And so I was forcing myself, and I was just miserable. Like even going into the 2011 Arnold, my foot hurt so bad. I remember going in for an axle press workout, and I missed a 285 or, or a 130 kilo axle. Just couldn't press it. Couldn't do anything with it. You just know, and I the thought, pain to just drop out sit this one out and then you know talking with her a little bit about it she talked me into doing it I need to get there and I need to compete we need to get the money and so I I, you know went into Travis mode and you know that that dig deep and find a way to make it happen anyway so I I kind of just thought about it for a while and I thought okay I'm gonna go in tomorrow I'm going to reset my attitude. I'm going to reset. I'm going to turn this off, turn this on. And we'll see what we can do. And the next day I went in and I hit 400 on the axle. So 182 kilos. And uh, yes, I mean, the mind mindset, my mind power is, is tremendous. Yeah. But using that in the way that I did, it just started depleting the reserves. And uh you know, I've competed, I've competed more than any other American. That much I'm certain. Um, and, you know, a number of those contests, 2011, 2012, I was just so burned out and forcing myself to go that I was just really digging into those reserves. I was depleting everything I had. Yeah. I always say that I burned the candle at both ends and started lighting up the middle of it too. So, <laughs> the whole fucking thing. But, uh, you know, there's some other things that were going on in my life that were also kind of eating away at me. And, uh, you know, that's the burning it in the middle part. And uh, I think by the end of 2012, I hadn't trained for six weeks. I went to America's Strongest Man. I still, I took sixth, I think. If I'd have gotten a 340 log, you know, 154 kilos, 153 kilos, if I'd have hit that, I would have taken third. So it was a real tight race. Yeah. But, you know, not training for six weeks, I finally started to feel good. My body felt okay. And then I took another couple months off after that. And I think <clears throat> I, uh, I just started to stop training. Yeah. 2013, 2014, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, and, and I'd been making some poor decisions at that point, you know, my, uh, on November 25th, my, this day, I'll remember this day cause it was the worst day of my life. You know, my wife and I had had problems and, uh, I remember we were going to try and move to England and see if we could start out there, maybe get away from some of the shit here. And so I took them to the airport. And I remember my son, you know, wearing his little Lightning McQueen baseball hat. He had his Lightning McQueen backpack and a little roller suitcase. <clears throat> and my wife was pushing the cart with the luggage on it. And I had this voice in the back of my head screaming at me. Bad idea, Travis. This is a bad idea. Don't freaking do it. Don't let this happen. Stop. But I kept rationalizing. No, no, no. We're going to try. We're going to make this work. And I was the only fool who believed that because I watched them walk through the doors at the airport and it shattered my world. 
that uh, that was the single most painful moment of my entire life. I thought my heart was literally going to drop dead right there. It, uh, you know, it, that voice was screaming at me that that was a bad idea. And that's because part of me knew that she never intended to make anything work. She just wanted to get away, go home, take my son and everything that was worth anything. How and was your son at the time? What's that? How old was your son at the time? He had just turned three, November 4th. So three years, three weeks. Yeah. And, you know, that, uh, well, I guess, you know, we, we can go ahead and get into some of the reasons why life was falling apart for me. So we'll back up a little bit. Nothing like starting a movie at the saddest point and then going back a few years, <laughs> two years prior. Um, I had made the mistake a few years before that, of maybe two years before that, of listening to a friend of mine's father, who was a nurse practitioner that ran a pain management clinic, saying, hey, come on in, you know, we'll get you set up with, with uh, some painkillers. And, uh, you know, you need this for training. It'll help, you know, you'll feel better. You'll be able to, you know, sleep better and blah, blah, blah. And, and I had taken painkillers, you know, there's, yeah. I still kind of think, and I hate to even encourage anybody, but on a long flight, a big guy like me, if I don't take a painkiller, the person next to me is going to die. You know? <laughs> but so, uh, anyway, um, I kind of justified like, yeah, you know what? We'll give this a shot. We'll see. And, and, you know, that little voice in the back of my head, it popped up then too. Just, you know, that little red flag, this may not be a good idea. And I didn't know how to listen to my intuition back then. I just wanted to rationalize everything. Turns out our subconscious is way the hell smarter than our conscious brain. <laughs> so, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I went and I, I got the prescription. There was a prescription for the painkillers. There was a prescription for this uh, muscle relaxer called Soma, which intensified the effects of the painkillers. And they wanted to prescribe me Xanax as well, but I wasn't interested in that. Thank yeah. God. Because Jesus Christ. The, the, that cocktail alone was responsible for more deaths than I care to admit. Yeah. You know, they, it was an epidemic. They actually, Fed started coming and shutting those places down. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I started taking them and I enjoyed it. I, I you know, I'll admit I felt good. Mm. Especially the first couple of times you get that warm feeling. You're all happy. There's no pain. You can get <laughs> then, through uh, workouts. You can okay. sleep. I said, you can, you, you got no pain. You can get through workouts. You can sleep. Yeah. It's, it's all just masking, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's exactly what it was, man. Yeah. There's a reason you get those signals from your body. So that was when I really started to dip into those reserves. That was the first time dipping into those reserves. And I didn't notice because it wasn't huge at first. <clears throat> but, you know, I remember thinking after a couple refills, there was a problem there. There was something you know, like I needed more. I wanted more. And trying to cut back, I really felt like shit. And so I didn't like that feeling, so I kept going. And I know eventually um, that addiction got so bad that I was, I was going to two different doctors back and forth every two weeks instead of getting a one-month prescription and going through it in two weeks. I think at one point I hit three doctors. Wow. I was just trying to go around. And... Uh, you know, it, it's a sad life because you walk into those places and you look around, you see the people and it's like, I don't belong here. Shit. Yeah. But you're just another one of the people in the crowd waiting for your prescription, pay $100, get your script, go pay two or $300 to get it filled. It was expensive shit. And, you know, I, I got to the point where you're supposed to take one of these painkillers four times a day. Okay. Uh, I got to the point during the qualifying round in 2010 World's Strongest Man, right after the power stairs, several hours before we were supposed to do the deadlift later in the evening. 
and I fucked the deadlift all to hell, probably because I took 10, wow. along five of the soma muscle relaxers, five muscle relaxers, 10 of the 10 milligram Vicodin painkillers. You know, like looking back, just God damn it, dude. <laughs> and I almost lost out on the finals because of that. But, uh, you know, actually something my son did uh, got me into the finals. The next day, I was sitting on the edge of the bed. And this is right before we were to go do the uh, circus dumbbell. Sitting on the edge of the bed, getting my mind right, trying to clear my head a little bit. And he's over there in the corner of the room playing. He looks over at me, gets up, and he takes his first steps. Walks right over to me. He was 10 I remember, months. You, I remember you telling us all at the time. Oh, yeah. my God. You know, God dang. He had this little smile on his face. I'm like, all right. Well, if you can do that for me, Jesus. I guess I'm going to have to get to the finals now. Yeah. And, uh, so I went out. I won the dumbbell and took second on the keg loading medley. And made it into the finals. I beat uh, Vitautas Lalas out. Wow. And then, uh, you know, we know what happened the first day of the finals. I ended up breaking my ankle. Yeah. But at that point, I'd gone through so much of my supply. I didn't have many painkillers left. So I was really fucking hurting. And the doctors, there were so many injuries that year that they'd already given out the yeah. painkillers they had. Um, so there was no help there. I, I, had, to, I had to limp through. <laughs> and I remember on the, uh, the flight home, the drink cart hitting me in that ankle. Ah. I was asleep. Oh God, dude, it sucked. Uh, but uh, you know, that, that just worsened things because it hurt so much. And I was so depressed because I felt that I really could have won that year. You know, I went right back into that hole, uh, trying to feel good through external means. And, you know, one thing about painkillers is it doesn't just numb you physically. It numbs you emotionally. So I was growing distant from my wife, you know, looking back, you know, she kind of fucked me over really bad. And I'm sorry to use all this bad language. I hope anybody out there doesn't get offended easily, but she, she really did. Um, but I honestly don't blame her for it. You know, I wasn't the person that she had married. You know, I wasn't bad to her in any way. It's not like I ever was violent or screamed at her or any shit like that. Just, I was not the guy she married. Yeah. And you know, just, I was really hoping for that chance in England to try and clear that monkey off my back. And it, and it is exactly that. You become, if you're addicted to something, you become a slave. And I hated that. I freaking hated that. I tried to kick that addiction a few times, but it was, it had me. That soma that intensifies it makes it so much harder to get off of. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it was awful. So, you know, needless to say, the, the several times I tried to kick it, it didn't work. Because not only do you physically have to kick it, the anxiety that comes with, oh my God, the world is so harsh and so like almost jagged. And, and yeah. you know, I, I feel like I'm different and people are going to notice and the anxiety is the part that I think you really need that support network for. Yeah. I think that's where people doing uh, rehab. I think that's the most crucial part is the therapy that they get. Uh, but you know me, I, I try to do everything on my own. So <laughs> did, did you find being, uh, and I, I mean, being a big, strong man, like we all are, sometimes that makes it even worse as well to sort of admit that you're feeling fragile or that you need help. I know yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, a lot yeah. of the time people look up to us and they expect us to be these big, strong guys that can cope with anything. I and, think that's where the anxiety kind of came from. Yeah. Is, you know, people have a view of you and you understand that people have that kind of view of you. And, you know, I guess maybe the ego is so fragile, especially at that point, that if you, if you fall from that position, you're shattering that sense of who you are. and you know, nobody likes that. No. But uh, sometimes it's necessary for growth. And you know, talk about shattering. You know, things got so much worse. 
uh, towards the end. So my wife and I, we had split up for like a month. She lived at the neighbor's house down the street um, right before we were planning on moving to England. So, <clears throat> which is another reason why it should have been really obvious that her plan was her plan. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot to that. But anyway, so uh, a friend, an old girlfriend of mine, who herself had gotten into meth, crystal meth. She's like, you know, I could send you some and then maybe, you know, whatever you want to do with it. And, you know, long, long time ago, I had tried it uh, actually with her. This was way before I had met my ex-wife. And, you know, coming from a guy who loved the original pre-workout ultimate orange you know i thought that shit was fun that the charge that you get you know that works for me and i knew it could be trouble so i, I got rid of any of that way early i, I didn't want to have any repeat with that or with my ex-girlfriend and uh so anyway fast forward years later like eight years later she just said i could send you some and you know being in the place that i was i took it tried it yeah and you know, I, uh, you, can, you can crush it up and snort it. You can put it in, say, coffee or something like that. Those ways are powerful. Smoking it is even more powerful. And so I, I started with that because that's what she did. And so that's what I did. And, you know, I had, uh, because I had taken peptides, I had all these insulin needles around. And I thought, you know... We'll step this up and see what, what happens. <laughs> it's really hard to admit that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we can laugh about it now, but yeah. <laughs> but, you know, part of me laughs, part of me still kind of hurts because it's like, God, if I hadn't done that, you know, what would my life but The thing be? is, your, your mind is not clear. So you, you end up doing this stuff and you, can, you, you surround yourself with, like we talked about earlier, you surround yourself with positive people. You surround yourself with, with these type of people it's, yeah. it becomes the norm and it's like, yeah. okay, that's, that's what I've got to do. Yeah. When you see it a lot, it's, it is, it becomes normal and it becomes the, the taboo effect. The yeah. shock effect. A, a lot of people might not understand that, that haven't been in that environment, but it's, it, it, it's very easy to slip into that kind of place. And then you kind of, you, you struggle to get out of it then as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially with something like that. Uh, so if smoking, it has a, far more intense effects than snorting it uh shooting it is far more far more intense than smoking it um you know i i tried that i think the first time i did that actually came after i took them to the airport and that pain that i felt was so intense i had to stop on the way home and it was the first time I could remember crying in, since I was a kid. You know, it, it was the first time. I take that back when my sister nearly died from uh, her own issues. I, I cried once then. But, <clears throat> you know, uh, that pain was so freaking intense. I was, I was willing to do whatever I could to get away from it. And so I said, you know what, Travis, all right, you have one week. Do whatever the fuck you want. Do whatever the hell you want. Get as fucked up as you want. Just get away from that, that pain. And uh, that week turned into four years. Wow. So, you know, I, I can remember, you know, loading up a syringe when I, I had a, I'd gotten some cocaine along with the methamphetamines. And I mixed them together. And I remember putting in my phone. 911, which for you is, I think, 999. Yeah. All emergency service. I, I had 911 dialed and the phone laying on my lap as I was injecting this, just in case something went wrong. I mean, that's like a really good indication of you shouldn't be freaking doing this if, if <laughs> you got to put 911 in. Ah, oh, God, just some dumb shit. But one of the things that I noticed was. With the meth, I didn't need the painkillers. 
And I think this is why it ended up hooking me because I thought, well, I can just stop this. I don't feel like I'm addicted to this. Uh, and that was before I ended up shooting it, but I noticed I could get off the painkillers finally. So I had this kind of positive momentum with using the new substance. Turns out that new substance was an even bigger monkey on my back and it was far more damaging. You go, you go in that, down that rabbit hole of things getting oh, worse and worse Jesus, and worse. Man. Oh, it just was a nightmare. So I ended up finally getting off the painkillers, but then I was full blown addicted to crystal meth and, and I, you know, at that point, if you think that you don't think clearly with painkillers in your system, you don't think clearly at all with that shit in you. In fact, it takes your thoughts and it'll twist every freaking neuron in your brain into something different. And uh, God dang, you know, at that point, it, just, a, just an example of how twisted your mind gets. My whole life, I loved bands like Metallica, Pantera, heavy metal kind of stuff i could not listen to it anymore what i liked listening to was the chaotic rhythm of dubstep and shit like that yeah that's how it changed up the wiring in my brain got yeah uh so couldn't work out anymore i hated that you know i just uh i started to lose everything and after a few years you know of of hurting the entire time because that's what it is you're trying to get away from pain and uh and it was emotional pain not so much physical anymore but i uh lost well i lost my family you know my son uh we had gotten a settlement for a car accident and she took all of that when it came in sent it to england never told me about it just kind of and with that, so I, <laughs> I had no savings. I'd been, you know, burning all of that. So I, I uh, my family, my, you know, my parents, my sister, they stopped talking to me. Uh, extended family, friends stopped talking to me. Training partners, people that live nearby. I lost everyone. And then I started losing everything. I started losing, you know, my, uh, my stuff, my home. I got foreclosed on, um, ended up, that's kind of an interesting story. I ended up living in a storage unit, but that was, that was my freedom. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So, you know, here I am losing everything, losing my mind, losing me, losing my passion. I remember looking in the mirror and this is something I, I really started to understand when I saw this show on HBO called Real Sports. They talk about professional athletes and once they retire there's a 75 percent divorce rate and it kind of comes about because that focused individual now has nowhere to put that energy they don't have they got rid of this massive area of their life and didn't replace with anything yeah so addiction becomes a thing uh divorce becomes a thing so all these things that i was going through you know i'd stop training I'd lost my passion. So that hole I was filling with just other shit. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I started to, to just, I, I noticed that everything around me sucked. I'd created this world of hell. And so I had this kind of routine way of looking at everything of how much I'd lost and how much hurt I was feeling how much everything around me was just trash and the people I was surrounding myself with were just not good for me. And, uh, you know, when you start focusing on the negative on a daily basis, you start to spiral downward. Yeah. You focus the negative, you see more of the negative. And I got to a point and, uh, you know, this came about after several times of trying to get a hold of my son trying to talk to him and I remember several times that he would say something like oh mommy's rolling her eyes or shaking her head so she's basically sitting there listening to the conversation and coaching him and, and, and just trashing me to my son and you know that hurt because that god damn he was like the you know one good thing in my life and I remember when you when you had him at con contests and things and you know 
I remember how sort of the, the, the proud look on your face when you were telling us stories, like in his first walk in and stuff like that. You know, piece of pictures with, with you and uh, Misha Kukloyev, because I know you named him after him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was, um, uh, just seeing y- y- your face every time you spoke about him, it was just clear to see how, you know, proud you were and, and how much of a, a being a dad meant to you. Yeah. Well, you know, I had a really good father. It's, you know, I love my I've, dad. I've, I've met your dad a few times. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, my dad. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I really, as far as fathering goes, so at one point when I was going through the stuff in my garage, I found this box. It's full of baseball mitts. And I'd collected them. I'd saved them for over the years. And I remember coming across one that was a left-handed thrower's mitt. It was a right-handed glove. I'm a right-handed thrower, so I'm thinking, you know, why did I get this mitt? And I remembered when I was nine years old, I thought I'm going to keep this mid because my son might be left-handed. I want to be able to teach him how to throw left-handed. What kind of nine-year-old thinks <laughs> yeah. teach their son? You know, that, that was just what I did. I, my whole life, I had all these lessons, how I learned things and how I would teach them better yeah. in the future. <laughs> Probably why I feel I'm a pretty decent coach because I've practiced teaching my entire life. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so you know, back to where I was with uh, everything in my life going wrong. Uh, my house had been foreclosed on. I was on borrowed time there. I would worked out a deal for a few months that I could stay, get my shit together. Um, and I remember sitting in my bathroom and, and this was the second lowest moment of my life. You know, I was full on in the darkness at this point. And, uh, you know, I'd gotten, I, I tried to reach my son again, and they didn't answer the phone. And I'm sitting here just going through all those things that I had lost and all the pain. <clears throat> and I remember getting my, my 40 caliber Beretta pistol out. And, you know, I'd almost had it. In my head, I'd had it. I was done. I didn't want to do this shit. I'd lost everything. I lost my passion. I lost my family. You know, strongman was gone. I hated training. I I couldn't even watch strongman. And I just wanted to be done with it. And so I'm sitting there with this pistol in my mouth and these hollow point nasty ass bullets in there. And I'm thinking, the poor bastard is going to have to clean this up. (laughs) I, I said, okay, no, we can come up with a different way. I can... You know, there's plenty of other cleaner ways so that someone doesn't have to fucking scrape your brains off the ceiling. Um, <clears throat> so I put the gun down and I'm, I'm kind of freaking out a little bit, obviously. You know, it, 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 when you get to that point and you start thinking about it, it, it fucks with you. It does. And I remember kind of having this desperate feeling of, I have to find something good. I have to find something to live for because God damn it, there is nothing here. And, uh, and I remember looking around and as I'm looking at the stuff in my house, I noticed that little negative checklist of all the things that I'd lost going through my head. And I noticed the spiraling down. I noticed that trend and I thought, well, okay, fuck. So I'm, if I'm always thinking about everything that's going wrong and I'm always thinking, it makes me feel worse. Every time I go through that, maybe if I just come up with one positive thing, one fucking positive thing, I could find some way out of this. And I looked around and I couldn't see anything worth having. And I kind of give up a little bit. You know, I just, I put my head in my hands and I look down and then I see my toes move. And I start to move my feet around and they were a little messed up. Because uh, tweaker feet are gross, especially because they're standing up all day and they're shooting that. They, they get, you get uh, cellulitis and shit like that. And, but they were working. They were still there. They were still working. And I thought to myself, you know what? They're beat up. But I can still get the hell up and I can go wherever the hell I want to. I can get up and get the fuck out of this house and go wherever I want to if I need to. And I got this sudden this surge of 
joy, this feeling that I hadn't had in years just surged up and I felt so good for the first time in years. I mean, it, it took my breath away. I didn't even know what to do with it. I just sat with it. And then, you know, I, later on, I kind of just laid down. I went to bed. I got up the next day and I said, I started getting that need of, okay, I, I got to go smoke or I got to go whatever. Um, and I thought to myself, find one good thing first. I want, I want that feeling before you taint it getting high. Yeah. And so I, you know, I got up and I thought, okay, well, I got my feet. I started looking around and there was that world of shit again. <laughs> There's, you know, uh, at the time I was, uh, I was driving around on trash nights and I'd, I'd pick up things that people would put out and I'd clean them up and resell them a little bit. So that was my, it, it was just kind of fun. I could work for myself. I had a boss. Um, so I had just shit everywhere. I had like three or four couches in my house that fixing up, you know, furniture and all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff, whatever. And so I looked around, I couldn't find anything. And then I thought, okay, man, you're trying too, you're trying too hard to find something too big, find something simple. You got to lower your standards a little bit. And I thought, all right, well, I got my own two feet. And I got my own two hands. My two hands, these hands are still strong as hell. And with these feet and these hands, I can still go anywhere and I can do anything that I want to do. And I got that surge again. I felt that joy. I rode it as long as I could that day. And on the third day, I got up, I found a third thing. On the fourth day, I found a fourth thing. On the fifth day, I didn't find anything. But I realized I had four things that I was grateful for. And I started keeping track. I would go through my list, hands, feet, this, that, every single day. And then I'd add another one. I'd add that to my list and I'd keep going. And what happened there was rather than looking at everything and seeing all the shit in my life and spiraling down, I was finding the one good thing and I was looking for more good things. I started spiraling upward. upward. And, you know, I had the same world around me, the same physical things in front of me, but I saw a whole different world. Started looking at it differently. Negativity, loss, and pain. I found things to be grateful for. You know, a book that I had read when I was 20 or something. It was, it was a great book. I started trying to read it again, but Tweaker Brain can't read. So I just remember being grateful that I had read it. Yeah. And just little things like that trained me to think completely different. And that changed my life. You know, at my lowest, darkest moment, I saw that tiny little speck of light called hope and started to pull myself out of that. And I remember the people around me. Now, misery loves company. Mm. People I had around me, we were all very good at supporting one another in our misery. And they did not like the fact that I was being grateful and finding things to be positive about and look for hope. I remember one time... This woman that, that came by, she lived down the street. She'd come over. We were just friends. She, uh, she had a lot of issues. She was on a bunch of different mood stabilizers, et cetera, et cetera. But she liked to drink and do coke a lot. Uh, she would never admit that to me, but it was obvious when she'd go to the bathroom every 30 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, but... I remember her, she'd get this attitude, this mean attitude some that, sometimes. And she looked at me, she said, what do you have to be so positive about? And I remember thinking, oh, shit, this is powerful. Yeah. This is shaking these people's world up. Oh, my God. Rather than that beating me down, I found strength in that. It's like, oh, I'm really fucking your fucking world up. This you're is back, back, back to Marshall saying you're going to come last. <laughs> that's exactly, you know, sometimes that's what you need is a little kick, a little, a little doubt. Yeah. I love positivity. I love building people up. But sometimes you need a guy that says, ah, you can't do that. Oh, all right, motherfucker. <laughs> watch me. <laughs> Just watch me. That's exactly it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it took a while because I still had that addiction. The physical, if you try to get off meth, physical sucks, but you get this depression. And you think that you can't do anything. You're not capable of anything. You can't even get up. It's, 
it's terrible. It's a huge funk. So, uh, you know, during this whole period, I had pretty much tried to do anything that would destroy me. So I started smoking cigarettes of all things. Yeah. I'd smoke cigarettes and I'd do little lottery scratch offs at the gas station. <laughs> Whatever, you know. Um, but I remember trying to stop smoking once and I started to notice there was an addiction there. And I thought, you know, this is such a waste of money. It's not giving me anything. I don't feel anything from it. It just, it sucks. And so I wanted to kick that. And I tried an experiment. I, every time, and I got this idea from A Clockwork Orange, that movie where they, you know, they brainwash him, they show him horrible things, they make him feel sick. Yeah. <clears throat> so I thought every time I light one of these up and inhale, I'm going to make myself feel physically ill. Okay. I'm going to feel like I'm suffocating with the smoke. I'm going to feel like I can't stand the smell. And the more intensely I focused on actually making myself nauseous, the faster it started to work. And within two weeks, I couldn't stand smoking. I'd light it up, feel sick, throw it away, couldn't think about it anymore. So I thought, well, shit, if you're working, yeah. maybe I'll try it with this. And, uh, you know, I'd stopped shooting, meth, thankfully. Uh, I had kind of found a way to talk myself out of that one. But I was still smoking it at that point. And so I thought, same thing applies. Every time you're going to feel sick, you're going to feel nauseous, you're going to feel like the smoke is suffocating you. And it's a lot more intense of an addiction, but it started to work. Yeah. It started to work. I started to not really like look forward to this thing anymore. And so slowly but surely, you know, I'd, I'd started to decrease my amount and, uh, you know, at this point, I had increased the positivity in my life. I had changed my mindset. And I was starting to get on the backside of this addiction just a little bit. Uh, and then I lost my house. And, you know, I, I remember feeling that I knew I was going to lose the house because the foreclosure and all that stuff. So I started to put my negative energy into it. Like, this is my prison. I can't physically get myself out of here because I just can't get myself uh, put together enough to, to work it out. Yeah. So I know I'm going to be forced out. This is my hell. This is my prison. And when they came to kick me out, you know, the police came, they, they evicted me. And, and I, was, I was this close to getting the stuff that I cared about into a storage unit the same storage unit that we did the training at for all those years. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I got, was so close. I was really bummed out and they kicked me out. You know, it hurt. And I remember going to the storage unit with the few things I did actually have in my truck before they came yeah. uh, to unload. And I remember being a little depressed on the one side because it hurts, you know, I kicked out of my house, but deep down, I knew I was free. Thank God this is finally over. I can't, I can't stay in this prison anymore and, and do what I'm doing, yeah. you know, cause I've been living on borrowed time. I hadn't really paid any bills. I've been fucking around. I couldn't do that if I was going to go somewhere else. So it was freedom. I ended up living in a 10 by 10 storage unit on top of a, two and a half feet wide, three feet long plyo box. Wow. My feet up on the shelf. That's where I would sleep. I had a little yoga mat that I'd lay on top of it. And, uh, I'd sleep in there. And thank God that we had trained there for so long because the two owners, uh, Linda and Steve, God bless them. See, they just kind of looked the other way. Yeah. Uh, well, the first time I was there all night, I was trying to rearrange stuff and maximize every little inch playing Tetris with my stuff. And Steve came over to me the next day and he says, you know, well, Travis, you can't stay here. You know that <laughs> good old Texas boy. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh yeah, of course. Of course. No, I'm, I was just working all night and sorry, got caught up. But, uh, you know, I, I stayed there and they didn't say anything. And I even ran a little power cord out to the power box and I had a light and I had a place to charge my phone and I could listen to my music on a little portable speaker. And 
And so what I was doing at that point was, you know, I was, I was trying to buy back my stuff that they had taken from my house. When they kick you out, they come in with a crew and they take anything of value and they'll either ransom it back to you or they'll sell it. Yeah. So I tried to get it back. Cause there's a couple things that, you know, stuff from my son, pictures, uh, my computers that had all of my pictures on with, uh, of my son and all that stuff. And so I bought back what I could. Um, I left some for them to sell, but I was still doing that refurbishing thing. And uh, a few months prior, my mom had gotten really sick. Her liver had started to fail. And I remember getting a call. Uh, this is from my aunt and they were in Reno at the time. I was still in Houston. And they're like, you know, you need to come out, to see your mom yeah. and real sick. And, and I thought, you know, Hey, yeah. I would, I would love to. I'd love to get out of here. I'm trying to. Because in, in this time, you, you kind of lost contact with your parents, didn't you? Yeah, it'd been a couple of years. Yeah. It's been a couple of years. They had moved to Reno a couple of years before that. And I hadn't really talked to them since they moved. And I didn't really talk to them much before that for you know, a variety of reasons. But um, so you know, I get this call and, you know, a friend of mine had just broken into my house. Friend. Trigger friend. That's, that's tweakers, man. God, I hate tweakers. tweakers. <laughs> but he'd broken into my house. He stole a bunch of things. But he also, when they were trying to help me uh, clear some stuff out and, and pack, his girlfriend had found a key to my safe. I got into my safe and stole my savings. Hmm. So I had, I had a few grand, like six grand saved up, and they stole it. And... Uh, I, when they, when my aunt called, I was like, look, here's what happened. I would love to drive out there. Is there any chance you guys could send me you know, 500 bucks? Oh no, we can't, we can't do that. I'm talking to my mom at this point. She's like, no, we, we can't do that. Yeah. You know, just, you know, on the one hand, I kind of understand, but on the other, it's like, look, I just told you, that, you know, <sighs> it, must, it must be a very hard situation for parents to, to be in. Because obviously you're you're no. trying to you're, you're getting yourself cleaned up, and they're not believing the, <laughs> the in, in, yeah I, I get it but yeah must must have been extremely frustrating, <laughs> especially because I mean I knew where I was yeah. at that point but I guess other people you know they don't you know it, it just kind of it sucked because they had spent a whole bunch of money fixing their house up and my mom's like oh no we don't have the money for that <laughs> you really man <laughs> you know what the fuck. Uh, so anyway, I stayed in the storage unit because I didn't have to pay for a hotel room. I could save money the fastest way possible. And it worked out. You know, I, I was there for like three months. Uh, I was there all the way through Christmas. Uh, I actually, I had one last thing that I wanted to do after I got my stuff back. I had this old truck. That was the only thing that I had left was, you know, my, my trophies, keepsakes, stuff about my son, you know, a, a little bit of furniture. I had this, ironically, I had this great king size mattress, the most comfortable bed ever, literally a foot and a half from where I was sleeping on that board. I, <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, couldn't, couldn't get on that anyway. Um, so my truck had been, uh, it was a Dodge Dakota. It, it, every Dodge from that year got sunburned. The paint started to peel off. And yeah. I remember at one point I had tried to strip the paint and repaint it. But, you know, typical tweaker fashion, I, I stripped the paint and then started with some base coat primer and got distracted. <laughs> so I had this tone base coat truck. <laughs> it was fucking awful. <laughs> So, you know, it was a, it was a point of pride for me. I had to get that painted yeah. before I could go anywhere or do anything. I had to do that. And so I stripped it down smooth, sanded it, and I had a sprayer and I had this uh, oil-based high gloss paint. I sprayed it down and it was so damn shiny. It had, it showed every freaking nick and dent and scratch. It, <laughs> it looked awful. So I had to kind of sand it a little bit and then mix some uh, gloss with some flat black. And, and it came out really good in the end. It actually looked really freaking good. 
And uh, by the time, I mean, the paint wasn't even dry yet. I had put a tarp in my bed, the bed of the truck, and started loading everything I could into it. And thank God I did, because later on, that saved my life when I was driving through snow. So here I am in this freshly painted truck, not even dried, and it was Boxing Day, uh, December 26th, in the evening, and I was gone. That was my, that was my ride to freedom. Yeah. You know, here I was in this staging point in the storage unit. I was still using meth at this point, but I greatly reduced the amount. And when I left, I burned all of my connections. You know, I cut phone numbers out. I didn't have any idea what I was going to. So there was nobody there. Yeah. I had just a little bit left and I had to dole it out and I had to really step down and monitor my intake. So that combined with having this mission of I'm going from Houston to Reno. It's a 2,000 mile trip. I've got Carlsbad Caverns. I got Grand Canyon. I got Mount uh, Zion National Park. Yeah. I got all these things that I want to see. So, what is a two day trip turned into 10 because okay. <laughs> I wanted, I looked around when I wanted, I ate when I wanted, I slept when I wanted. And uh, it was the ultimate ride to freedom. I had this. First off, I was excited. I had built this mindset of being grateful for things. So every obstacle that came up was a new fun challenge. And the addiction was just losing its control. It's right. losing its stranglehold because I had something else to replace it. Yeah. You know, and I didn't realize at the time that that was what was going on. But looking back, that was the most powerful way of getting off of anything ever. And, uh, by the time I got to Reno, the, the meth was gone. And there was only a couple points where I kind of woke up and thought, God, you know, I really could use, I, I would like it right now. But yeah, having no connections, I had to just let that thought go and then carry on with my day. Brilliant. And, you know, it only took a couple weeks for that to clear my system. But combined with that positive mindset, I couldn't wait to get in the gym again. So you hadn't trained at all in this period. What's that? You hadn't trained at all in this period of time. No, no. I, I had kind of lifted a couple times here or there because I had stuff in my garage. I remember at one point trying a 600 pound deadlift. It didn't move. Um, you know, and that was a couple of years before even this point. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe four or five times in a year at most. Yeah. You know, I had done some things with grip. Yeah. Just because I was doing scrap metal as well. I, you know, when I pick stuff up, I'd pick up things I could scrap. And I remember I had this challenge where I would take a printer and I would rip the whole thing apart with my bare hands. And I got pretty good at it. You know, just <laughs> like bending bars. I, you know, I had really strong forms and grip at that point, but uh, that was the only real any kind of strength yeah. training. Um, but, uh, I remember getting there January 7th and then training January 15th for the first time. And I did a little bit of upper body stuff. Uh, the next week I tried to deadlift. I went, <laughs> I put 405, which is 185 kilos or so on the bar. I did three reps and I thought it had broken my back. <laughs> <laughs> that's how much I had lost because I mean when I was when I was in the storage unit I'd eat one time every day and a half so yeah. I'd eat one morning and then like the next evening and then like the next whole you know what, what did your body weight come down to so that interesting thing there I remember at one point during the the darkness kind of asking you know when is this hell going to be over with and that little voice in the back of my head pops up and says you're going to start over yeah I knew what that meant. I knew that everything I had gained with strongman was gone. Yeah. I was going to have to start over. And oddly enough, at my very first competition with Marshall, I weighed 227 pounds. I was technically a lightweight, still competed with the big boys. Um, the first day I walked back in the gym, I was 227 pounds. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I had been 341. Yeah five kilos down to 102 kilos and uh 
yeah, I gained weight pretty quick when I started eating again and training. Uh, not all of it good. I think I gained something like uh, 70 pounds, like 32 kilos in a couple of months. Yeah. And then uh, a lot of it muscle, a lot of it fat, but kind of I, I peaked and then I dropped it back down and, and built up slowly since then. But, <clears throat> you know, something, your metabolism changes when you get off meth you start gaining weight really quickly. <laughs> you don't see many meth heads that are, are big. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> but, uh, oh, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm so yeah. pleased to sort of hear you, you're kind of on the way back up and, you know, to see you back competing again now, it's, it's so good. Because, like, for a long time, you know, we, we were good friends, you know, before it all, and then... You know, you try and contact you on social media, like Facebook and stuff like that. We used to message each other. I'd message yeah. you and there would just be no reply or, you know, and there was never any update. So you, you just sort of, you, you lose touch with people. And then yeah. you obviously don't know what Drop they're... they're the of the earth. Yeah. But to see, yeah. you, to see you back in Strongman now, <laughs> back competing, feeling positive, putting your, your negative experiences to a positive use now and helping so many people. I mean, I'm sure... I mean, do, do, you, do you see your son or not? That's still, you know, that I don't actually know where they are. They That's moved. Good. I had uh, I had her parents' address, and I sent things to them all the time. And then eventually they just started getting returned. And so it has been about three years since I've had any contact, or two years since I've talked to them. I how, old, seen, how, how old is he now? He's 10, 10 and a half. So hopefully, yeah. you know, he's going to see you in Strongman or, or something and I want to reconnect at some point. You know, that was, that was a big part of the reason why I got back into competing. I saw how big it got in England. Yeah. And I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to see, I wanted him to see his dad. You know, even, even if he wasn't ready to, to contact me um and i get that you know just a kid and god knows what his mom has told him um but to see someone on tv that he can be proud of and yeah. say you know what maybe maybe not everything i was told is true maybe so if, if 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 by some chance he was to see this what would you want to say to him oh man <laughs> That might take up way too much time to be pissed. <laughs> you know, I love, I love you to death. Uh, I'm so sorry the way things worked out with uh, his mom and me. And I'm so sorry that, you know, whatever he thinks of me, whatever's happened, whatever his mom did, I, I hope he realizes that his mom did the best she could with what she had. Uh, Maybe a little more, but <laughs> but I want him to know that I think of him every single day without fail. I've got his picture. I've got his passport photo in my wallet. I've got his second birthday picture in my wallet. I've got, you know, I look at pictures of him all the time. I think about him and I still to this day think, what would I tell him? You know, and I've got a journal where some of these things come up. What would I tell him? I, I started writing them out. Uh, you know, if anything, I just wanted to know that I was thinking about him this whole time. And, and I hope that he, I hope that he's grown up with some uh, compassion. I hope that he, I hope that he tries as hard as he did when he was a kid because he was so amazing at things when he tried and he, he'd get up and he'd mess up and then he'd try again and he'd keep going till he got it. You know, that, that tenacity that I just loved watching that. And I loved watching him develop. I remember the first time we had a conversation, like the first time he put a full sentence together. And, uh, you know, I remember, I remember leaving, medicine balls around and he would start 
loading them onto the couch like they were Atlas stones. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually shit one time. Steve uh, Steve Slater made these mini Atlas stones for the guys, me and David Austin, because we both had sons. Um, he gave them to us at uh, 2010 Arnold or 2011 Arnold. And I remember taking it home, having it sitting in the corner of my, my bedroom. And this thing's 22 pounds. It's like 10 kilos. And uh, I'm in the bathroom and I hear this. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? I go over there and there's my son butt ass naked picking this stone up. And I'm like, what are you doing, boy? He picks it up, he looks at me, and he drops it on the ground. Holy shit. <laughs> He's the Freaking mini stone animal. man. Yeah. God dang, man. Yeah. Talk about a proud papa moment. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I, I, I genuinely, genuinely hope you guys do get to recommunicate with each other and, and develop a, a relationship again. Because obviously, I've got three kids. I know exactly what it's like. Um, uh, and I appreciate you talking about it as well, because it's not an easy subject to talk about, especially, like I said before, yeah. we're supposed to be these big, strong men that can handle anything. And, and often quite, you know, I've got experienced this myself. You, you, you're a little boy inside sometimes. You've got this big frame that looks impressive, but there's this little scared yeah. boy inside. And uh, I, I want to really thank you for opening up. I hope a lot of people that, that watch this, appreciate a different chat because obviously you know it's great talking about the big achievements that we've had and strongman and stuff like that but there's more important things in life than than lifting up weights it's it's something we do for fun it gives us discipline it gives us you know drive but i think your story and, and seeing you come through what you have i think if you can get that relationship back with your son it'll make it all worthwhile and I hope they do see this and, and you get some kind of, of communication again with each other. You know, I think uh, I've always felt that it'll happen when it's supposed to. It will. You know, it'll, uh, it'll come about the way it should. And I will hopefully at that point, never, ever lose touch with them. You know, I think part of it was, you know, I had all these ways of wanting to teach and I probably would have just overwhelmed the crap out of him. <laughs> end up resenting me but oh, now shut up dad <laughs> you know, maybe, he'll, maybe he'll appreciate what what i've got the knowledge that i've got and see it in a whole different way at least that's what i tell myself so that i feel better about it <laughs> it will it, it, it'll it'll come around it'll it'll happen it will just stay positive yeah, but you, one of the things you said you know you, you talk about you know the the things we learned from strong men things that I learned, I think, that applied to my life and in getting me where I am now, and especially with all the injuries. You know, for, for anybody watching, you, you learn the discipline, you learn the patience, you learn tenacity, you learn how to grind without ever seeing a result for a while, and then suddenly you'll get something. If you keep pushing forward, you'll get something. Um, when it comes to life, you know, when, uh, or, or when it comes to like injuries, let's go there. Cause you've had a lot of injuries. I've had a lot of injuries. You pushed on and you went through so many of them where we talked about earlier. It takes one, usually maybe two and guys are done. Like, yeah. Oh, fuck that, that sucked. Um, it's, it's all about, because an injury takes that something out of your life. You're not able to train. Yeah. So you're left with that hole. You have to fill it with something else. And for me, it's having a different goal. It was when I tore my rotator cuff in this arm and I had to have it completely immobilized. I came up with things to do with my other arm. I started doing one arm deadlifts and one arm dumbbell clean and press and anything I could do to have another goal. And that's the way it is with anything. You know, soon enough, I was able to use this side, but losing this and filling it with this instead of letting something else dictate what what goes in there absolutely a hundred percent right i think the type of people we are we're goal orientated you need a focus in your life and without that focus we we let ourselves go into those negative states i'm very much i need a goal 
And for a long time, strongman was that goal. And, and now my, my goals have changed. There's, there's different things that I'm focused on. But I went through a stage of not knowing what I wanted and, and feeling lost. And, you know, I'd lost that drive to, to compete. I was still trying to do it because it was just my job. But I'd lost that, that spark that I had when, when we were competing and I was younger. That's that point when you look in the mirror and you don't know who's looking back at you. Yeah. It's a scary point right and there. It, it is. But eventually, you just try it like you did. You got those one things that you were positive about. I, I always just try to focus on one day at a time. So I get through this day and set a goal, little goals, whether it's something stupid like get dressed, <laughs> you know, something stupid like that. But just get dressed, prep some food. Five daily wins, five daily wins for all my clients. I tell them five little things, five yeah. daily wins, wash and them to then. And then the, the, the easy things start to become easier and the bigger things start to become easier. You know, you start finding, okay, that wasn't so hard. I can do the next thing and I could do the next thing. And you build yeah. yourself into a, a positive you're, state. You're practicing how to win or practicing how to do, be successful, yep. you know, and it's like baby steps. You, you get up and you walk along with, you yep. know, on the table and then eventually you take steps and you fall and then you take steps and you start running. Exactly. Exactly. Same, we got to learn the same way all throughout life. You can't yeah. just give in. <laughs> no, it's 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 a great kind of lesson for for athletes and for people in life. It really is. Before I let you go, Travis, what's the future plans? Because obviously you're back competing. We're we're all so pleased to see you back. Um, I think what was it about a year or so ago? I saw you over in England. Uh, um, one of Glenn Ross's comps. It was uh, August twenty sixth, twenty eighteen. Cool. So. I, uh, I, get, I, get, I mean, I know you've done a few of the Champions Leagues again. Yeah. Do you want to get back to World's Strongest Man? What are the, I is it, yeah? I 100% do. I 100% do. So, you know, I, uh, I've always been friends with Marcel, who runs Champions League. So that was kind of my natural first step. Uh, and, and even with my history, my track record, and this is where people need to start learning. So I get this question a lot. How do you get into Champions League? Well, swallow your pride and ask. Yeah. So I sent Marcel an email. I said, look, hey, I'm training. I'm ready. I really want to compete. I will get myself over there if you let me compete. So I had to pay my way to Serbia, like 1700 bucks or something. And he said, okay, if you get here, you know, I'll, I'll put you in a hotel room and we'll feed yeah. you. You get here, you pay that part and compete. Cool. If, you know, if you're... If you are where you say you are, then uh, we'll see what happens after that. So I went over there and I, I kicked ass. I got second place. And that was the other side of that is put on a fucking show. If you yeah. want to go to a contest and then get invited back, have fun and put on a show. Very so cool. had fun. I did well. And then I got invited back to more Champions Leagues. And then, Do you know, I'd love to see you over in the UK at one of the big arena shows. I think oh, you man. you deserve a shot at one of them because the sport has grown so much since you, you've been away from it. And I know how much you would love the atmosphere and the, the, the fans. Sure. Are just the, the fans over here are awesome. You, know, you can get in front of 10,000 people. It, it's, a, it's an incredible experience. I mean, for me, when I won Europe's Strongest Man in front of 12,000 screaming British fans, Eddie Hall breaking the deadlift record that night. I beat yeah. Thor at Europe's Strongest Man. You know, I'm never going to say I'm better than Thor, but that was my night. It was my night. It was a brilliant show. And just having, feeding off that electricity in front of all those people. It, it's oh, man, a spine-chilling moment. Static in the air, yeah. electricity charging. Oh, I, I know how much you would enjoy it. So we, we got <laughs> to see you at one of those. That, that's got to happen. I think you'd enjoy well, that more invited. than World's Strongest. I got invited to one of the Giants live shows, uh, but unfortunately, that was postponed because of all this shit going on. So Hopefully it'll be back. Got the invite, so I plan on earning my spot, the world's strongest man, and kicking ass. I want to. I want to knock some of these new guys around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Going to teach them a lesson. I'd like to see you, you and Evan like Singleton. You, have you met Evan Singleton? I've talked to him. Yeah, I've talked you, to him you, you, you guys con in a con. I think I think away from contest you get on great, but contest head to head, you guys that would be a good fun battle for people to watch. <laughs> <laughs> that actually might be fun. That actually, you know, I've talked to him several times, but never in a contest setting. So that might be cool. He, he's a good kid. Behind the scenes, he's a good kid. He puts on a 
he's, he's from a wrestling background, so he kind of yeah. has that bravado and stuff, but he, he's a good <laughs> behind the scenes. <laughs> I thought I, I might have to put him in his place at some point, but I've, I've stepped back now. I'll, I'll let Travis come in and put him in, put him in his place. <laughs> yeah. Travis, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you again for opening up and telling us your story. I hope it inspires a lot of people and, you know, <clears> makes people realise you can come back from anything and that's know. that's what i'm just gonna say man you know if i've learned anything when life knocks you down you don't have to stay there yeah it's your yeah. choice to get back up if you want to make something of it if you want to go somewhere if you want to become whatever you want to become it's up to you you got to get off your ass and you got to do it absolutely perfect man again thank you for coming on I look forward to seeing you once we can get traveling again and, you know, get you back over here for a contest. It's going to be, going to be awesome to see you. Dude, I look forward to the day, my friend. Good man. Guys, thank you for watching. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Travis, Travis, where can people find you on social media? Uh, Travis, I don't know if there's an underscore. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll find it and I'll put it in the link. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's only one Travis Ortmeyer out there. When you search it, you'll find me. <laughs> you'll know yeah. the one. Awesome. Guys, um, we will see you soon. Travis, we'll get you on again soon, man. We'll talk more about Strongman, but today was, was really interesting. It was really good to have you. Take care. I appreciate it, man. Thank you, guys. We will see you soon with more Strongman Chats.